Hello guys, uh, good afternoon. Uh, I hope this has been a long afternoon for all of you. Since 2 o'clock. I'm sure you would have a good experience of listening to Jasmeer and the uh, speaker before me. So, my name is Amit Sharma. I'm the Solutions Architect with uh, Amazon Web Services. Uh, anybody uh, who's not aware of what Amazon Web Services is? No? Or anybody is aware of it? No? So Amazon Web Services is an Amazon.com company. It's a separate business unit of Amazon itself. And uh, we are purely into infrastructure web services. So when I say infrastructure web services, it's purely around uh, offering storage, compute, networking, all of those as a pay-as-you-go model for our end customers for them to uh, you know, build their uh, sophisticated, scalable, and secure web applications. And how many of here are purely technical and how many are from business side? How many are pure business? I saw this session may not be for you. And uh, others are pure technical. Yeah, I know just me. <laughs> right, so, <clears throat> so for the non-tech folks who are from business side, I'll just try to put in some of the business stuff as well so that you get some context around it. Uh, so I was given this agenda on infrastructure automation, so I'm sure Jaspeer also spoke about it as to how NDTV has been using uh, Puppet uh, around the entire uh, infrastructure and application automation, etc. So my topic will be primarily around uh, my topic will be primarily around how you achieve this automation in AWS, in Amazon Web Services. So the, before I start, there is something called an Activate program that we have. So please uh, register for that. It's open for everyone. So uh, uh, it gives you a lot of uh, benefits like we give the promotional credits. Uh, you also get some 30 day trial for the support, uh, business support that we have. We do a number of trainings. We do a number of office hours where uh, uh, customers of similar domain can come and uh, you know, uh, do a brainstorming around that. Plus a lot of special offers that we keep on doing that. So just register for it. There is no charge for registration as such. Right, so a quick agenda. It's a, a bit long agenda, so please bear with me. At, uh, Mitesh from Night of Spring Code actually told me that keep it as informative as possible, so I'll try to do that. I just hope that I don't bore you to death doing that. So I'll talk about AWS and automation. And uh, there are these multiple services, Elastic Beanstalk, CloudFormation, OpsWorks, which allows the customers and startups and uh, in fact customers of all sizes to do automation to the maximum extent that has been possible. And this is totally integrated into Amazon Web Services. So we'll talk about those and you will hear all these three terms very frequently in this session today. Plus I have a couple of demos on Elastic Beanstalk and CloudFormation, so that will be interesting for the guys coming from a technical background. Yes. And then of course there, there is a question Q&A, so please interrupt me whenever you want to go no from so Quick overview of the Amazon Web Services products and services. So uh, AWS, uh, we do not categorize our services into IaaS, PaaS, SaaS and all that because we believe the boundaries have blurred and there are uh, no clear distinctions as to which service will fall in what uh, domain. So, as you can see, we categorize our services into networking, compute, storage, databases, applications, etc. So, uh, during the course of the slide uh, this presentation, I'll cover some of those services in more details. Now, since you are startups, uh, I'm sure a lot of you would be uh, listening to your customers very seriously, and your customers would always say that give me a fast application. Uh, <laughs> at the same time, give me an application which is always on, or give me a service which is always on has lots of features built into it, so you will want to put in as many features as you want into your uh, services. And finally, last but not the least, they will also expect a lot of customization and personalization on your web service. Right? So, well, that's easy to say, but how do you normally do, do that? So, and how does that fit in into the overall con context of automation? So, before we jump into automation, so let us see automation in, con in context to the larger picture. That is, when you run applications into cloud, into say Amazon Web Services or for that matter in any of the cloud environment, there are certain rules or certain uh, approaches that you have to take to create your application. 
So you cannot just take an application running in a physical environment and put it into cloud and expect the benefits of cloud also to be visible immediately. That does not happen. So that has to be taken very seriously that when you create an application and put it onto cloud, there are certain rules that you need to follow which Technically, your application may just run if you just pick it, pick and drop into cloud, but that will not give you those benefits. So, what are those rules? Let us first see that, and that will actually set the context of automation as well. So, the rule number one is serve all the web requests that you want. Every request that comes onto your application should be served. Now, how that happens, I will not go too deep into the whole Amazon Web Services and how it allows you to do that, but customers like NDTV and others have actually leveraged that extremely well. They leverage the entire global infrastructure to make sure that none of the requests that come onto your websites are dropped. Second is, request, uh, serve the request as fast as possible. Sorry, the color combination may not be too great, but uh, you will see the upload. So choose the fastest route. So uh, many DNS server services across the uh, board have these uh, features of latency-based routing and routing to the nearest pop, etc. So uh, a lot of startups actually leverage that. So uh, I'm talking about the startups like Instagram, Pinterest, uh, Netflix, etc. So they all leverage that. So they make sure that the request is routed to the nearest pop. Offload your application servers. Now this is uh, a bit of an abstract concept, but at the same time extremely powerful. That if there are certain services available, then don't uh, load your compute nodes to uh, give out those services. In this case, for example, content delivery networks. I'm sure you have heard about what CDNs are, content delivery networks. So try to offload the static and dynamic content to the CDNs rather than letting that load come back to the compute nodes. Very important concept takes almost 40 to 50 percent load off your compute nodes, and your compute nodes can only do what they do the best. Next is the caching. So, this again is a bit of an undervalued concept uh, that we have seen across the table. So, I keep on speaking to a lot of customers in North of India, and caching is something, is something that is not given as priority as it should be. So, caching can happen at every layer. So, CDN is the caching at the web layer, then there is caching that is possible between the app and the database layer which is the last memcache, redis and all of those. So there are services available so we advise our customers to leverage that. <laughs> Apart from that, single digit latency is where it matters. So this is more in context of the databases. So when databases scale, it becomes extremely important that you don't put everything onto a MySQL or a relational database. Think about putting some of that, that load out to some of the newer skills like the MongoDB and other, some of the other services which are available. Very important concept, not very easy to execute though, but it's an issue, uh, all the big uh, companies like the Shazam and all, they actually leverage newer skill for their uh, unique use case. You know what Shazam does? You make it hear a song and it will actually go and query. That's execute. It's so. Uh, Strange, right? How they have it. And none of the relational databases across the world will be able to handle that and they leverage all the new skills for that. Next is the scale. So, scale is a very important concept. So, your applications may work extremely fine for a few hundreds of thousands of users, but when you actually scale to much larger numbers, say millions of customers and all, the whole architecture needs to be defined according to that. And that is what, uh, so scale up is one option, scaling out is the another uh, paradigm that comes in the cloud. So, don't try to uh, jack up your compute nodes from two cores to four cores to eight cores and all that. Try to spread that load across multiple compute nodes in parallel, and when you don't need them, just uh, shift that load back to the, uh, the pool of resources. That is called horizontal scaling. Uh, uh, we have this concept of auto scaling, etc., which allows customers to in, uh, easily implement all this. Simplify architecture with services. Again, now like if you have been using some of the services like queuing or let's say some of the database services, you can either build on those services of your own on some of the compute nodes, or you can just offload those to some of the services that most of the cloud providers would generally have. So queuing databases are some of the uh, uh, some of the low hanging fruits which you can offload to the cloud. So this is uh, the first thing from that. So on prem, instead of focusing on your business, you sometimes tend to focus more on to creating a service for yourself. Whereas in a cloud-like environment, you can actually focus more on your application and just leverage a service which already gives you that as a service. So, so your whole point is that you move away from the servers and move into a service. Services are, in most of the cases, do not have a single point of failure. 
they scale extremely well and they have security etc built in as part of the service. Next comes the automate, uh, the whole automation part of it. So as you can see, so all of the various aspects of designing your application in a cloud, automation is just one aspect of it. Very important if you really want your applications to scale to that level. So automate for operational management. And uh, this is true for almost every cloud, or, if, or at least if you're evaluating a cloud, you should keep these things in mind, that anything in a cloud should be, automate, uh, should be automatable. What that means is, uh, launching a compute node, attaching a storage, creating a storage, increasing the size of the storage, creating new routers or new routes, etc., should all be an API call. And that is what typically happens as you can see compute, security, ARS, databases, everything just becomes an API call. And all of these APIs are available through SDKs across various uh, programming platforms like PHP.NET, Java, etc. Right, so that's a very important aspect. So if you are planning to go for a cloud-based uh, uh, infrastructure, make sure that you have full visibility of what things can be automated, what cannot be automated, because this is the the, the holy grail of going, kind of going to the cloud. So these are some of the services. As I said, this is the prime agenda. So I'll come to those. So Opsworks, CloudFormation, Beanstack have a varying amount of flexibility into them. And they are meant for slightly different purposes, so I'll try to uh, convey this to the uh, to all of you. And then, uh, then there are some other aspects like bootstrapping, auto scaling, cloud watch, etc. So a lot of customers actually leverage that very important concept. So uh, the whole concept is that to create a base minimum image of the operating system and let that uh, machine, when it comes up, takes its character at the very last moment. What that means is the machine should by itself not be hard-coded on whether it's an application server or it's a database server or it's a web server. It should get its character at the very last moment. That's the whole idea of putting your workflows into your cloud. So that is called bootstrapping, auto scaling, and uh, some of the some of the OEMs like uh, Red Hat, CentOS, Ubuntu now officially support these concepts in the cloud-like environments. Lastly, there is something called, uh, so, so every cloud provider, for example, will have their own way of billing, etc. So that is extremely important for you to understand whenever you choose that. So there are, in Amazon, there are multiple ways of doing that. I'll not go into this, this is more for the business users as well. But there are like spot instances reserved on demand, which allows you to predict your workload and get the maximum bang for your buck by committing to some of those uh, plans. Right, so, let us now jump into the automation aspect. So, why automate? What can we automate? This is important. This is what uh, we will try to understand here. And then see what are the tools and methods. So, this was the Ford factory way back, I think more than 100 years back. So, uh, people used to, or Ford used to manufacture the cars, etc., in assembly lines. Extremely good concept. And assembly lines actually help create a commodity product out of a luxury product, right? Uh, it dropped prices so that it can be mass produced, standardized, and available. Excellent idea and actually got something out into the market very nicely. However, assembly lines had their own problems. Those were all human driven, right? So there were all the scope of errors, etc. And uh, the quality was also somehow not consistent. So two subsequent cars from the same assembly line may not have the same characteristics. Right, and apart from that, only black, you know that typical, uh, uh, the very famous comment from Henry Ford, you can order any color of the car as long as it's black. <laughs> yeah, so, fast forward a few, uh, not few years, 100 years, and now we have robots manufacturing those sort of cars, and that is where the automation comes into. So let us extend that into IT as well. So these are... A couple of my colleagues actually, they are racking a server. If you've seen a server, it's a 50 big server, so they are racking the server. Nothing wrong with it. Only issue is that this is an upside down server. Right, so they are trying to put it upside down, and I'm sure the RAM would have been out of its slot by now. So, let us quickly look at some of the uh, printing blocks that Amazon has. So AWS EC2, for example, are as virtual servers, so you can select from a whole variety of servers which are available in the cloud. Route 53 is the DNS service, uh, which allows you to register your domain and then use Route 53 to serve all the DNS requests, etc. Auto-scaling is for horizontal scaling, 
So depending upon the load criteria, etc., it will keep on launching more and more instances, and when the load comes down, it will terminate some of the servers. So this was the compute and networking. Next is the storage. So elastic block store is a it's a block store, by, uh, as you can see from the nature of it. So you can attach it to a compute node, format it, and start using it, and you can format it to whatever file system you want to use to create HD four, etc. S3 is an object store, so it's a storage for the internet. There is no limit to how much data you can dump it there. Um, it's, a, it's a simple storage service. It has 11 nines of durability. It cannot be mounted like Elastic Block Store, but at the same time, it has huge uh, capacity both in terms of storage as well as how much throughput it can handle. Next is the instance stores. These are the direct attached storages which are available within the EC2 instances. Those are ephemeral in nature. Next are the databases. So RPS is the relational database service. So we have MySQL, Oracle, SQL Server, Postgre. All of these options are available in RPS now. PanamaDB is a low SQL, uh, very uh, low latency and highly consistent database, low SQL database that we have. Uh, it, uh, you don't need to provision the capacity on DynamoDB, it just scales automatically depending upon the uh, load that comes in or you can actually find your requirements. Or uh, you can run your own databases on EC2, for example, db 2 and all that. As I spoke about the automation, so uh, all of the three aspects that I spoke earlier, the, the storage, computing, databases, etc., all of those are API calls available across multiple platforms. And there are also integrated development environments available in Visual Studios and uh, Eclipse, so that you don't need to do standalone development, it can be integrated into those environments as well. Right, so finally we come to Beanstalk, Elastic Beanstalk. Uh, <coughs> so simply saying Elastic Beanstalk, what it does is it takes the, you can upload your code. So suppose you have uh, your uh, .war file created for your web application or for a PHP. Uh, if you have a PHP app, you can zip that, uh, that PHP app and upload that into Beanstalk. And it supports multiple platform, .NET, PHP, Java, Node.js, etc. And once you deploy it on top of that, what it does is the host is already there, the operating system is already there. In fact, right until the application service is already there, and your code just sits on top of that, and that's it. And your code will be up and running in less than 10 minutes. So you don't need to worry about launching a load balancer, launching the EC2 instances, launching the storage, and all that. So that entire aspect of launching a web application is totally offloaded to a service. Now, you know what this is typically called platform as a service, but we don't officially call that. So we call it Elastic Beanstalk. Now, think here is that what, what it might differentiate against other uh, past like offerings is that you still retain the full control of the underlying infrastructure. You can still log into each of those EC2 instances that have come up, do your own thing in there, change uh, the storage or whatever you want to do in there. Uh, uh, so the font is black on black, but uh, what it allows you to do is you can take multiple versions of the applications. So you can have version 1, version 2, version 3, version 4 and so on. And at the same time you can have multiple environments in an application. Why would you need that? Because you can have an application and you can have a dev test staging and the production environments for the same application. And all of those can be maintained uh, into this. And if you want to switch from one to another, it, it is as easy as swapping a UI. Or if you, you, know, you are not happy with the version 4 of your application, you can always go back to the version 3. That is all built into Beanstalk. You won't need to do anything extra. And you can also save the entire environment configuration so that uh, that becomes repeatable. There are the CLI options as well, and this is also integrated with Git. So if you are already publishing your code into Git, then that Git repository itself can be used into Beanstalk to launch the environment. Now these are some of the aspects that you can control. You can control the region, so you can pick up the region, whether you want to launch it in Singapore, you want to launch it in Tokyo, or whichever region. Plus you can also select the container type. It can be PHP, Java, .NET, whatever container you want. It can be across single server or it can be a fully production workload across multiple instances and all that. And uh, databases can also be spun up as part of this. So this is how uh, what Elastic Beanstalk will launch in the background. It will launch one load balancer. So this is a load balancer. 
and then there are multiple ECB instances uh, which will cater to that code and the auto scaling will automatically be configured on it so that you don't need to do that and when the load increases the number of servers will automatically increase and shrink depending upon the load and this application will automatically be also available on something called plasticbeanstock.com which is the URL for your application you can also snap it to your own uh, URL using the canonical main mapping system So these are some of the prerequisites for uh, uh, creating a CLI based environment. <coughs> it allows for a zero downtime deployment. So as I said, you can have multiple environments on a single application and you can switch between the various environments with just click over button. So if you're happy with the staging environment and you want to now put it into production, there's something called swap URLs. So just with swap URLs, your staging environment will go into production. What is the cost of Beanstalk? It's absolutely free. Whatever uh, things that get launched as part of the Beanstalk is charged. So, did you get a fair idea of what Elastic Beanstalk is? Yeah. So, I'll show you a quick demo. So, it was a pre recorded demo. I do not have network connectivity here, but I think it should give you an idea. Whether you want to do a test environment or you want to do a production, depending upon that, it will pick up that. And uh, in this case, uh, we selected a sample application, so this will not do much, it will just display a sample web page. You can optionally also launch a database along with that. Selecting an instance type, what size of an instance you want to use in there, and what key pairs you want to attack, uh, use along with that. That's it. So now your application has been put in there and this is automatically creating the entire infrastructure in the background. This is PHP path. You will see all the events that are happening in the background. It will show a load balancer being launched, auto scaling being configured, EC2 instance being launched, etc. So, so from that to this, it won't take uh, more than 10 minutes. Once that is uh, done, you will actually be able to see that all the events are successful. The status of the application is healthy. Now clicking on that, so this is the sample page, as you can see that something about elasticbeanstalk.com URL has come up. Now what we are going to do is uh, replace this with your own custom code, so this is index.php, does nothing much, just plays out hello world. So we are going to zip that into a zip folder and upload this and update that beanstalk application that was just launched. Uploading a new version of the same app. So here you'll be able to see all the versions of the applications. Now, once this is uh, deployed. Refreshing the same URL, you will see that this application has been updated in there. 
So this application comes up there. So as you see, as that the whole value proposition of green stock is that it, so you are the, as a developer you don't need to worry about the underlying infrastructure, great storage, networking, load balances, computers, and all that. Just push your code and uh, let the green stock do everything for you in the back. So basically, it's it's a template for the green stock. Does it provide Amazon provide templating functions for Beans stack? Like we can copy the templates? Yes, so, so these versions are nothing but templates now. And there is something called parameter groups in the background which allows you to say that I want to always launch my servers on this particular capacity. So that becomes a template. So are you talking template in a VMware term or more on Amazon? More in Amazon. Yeah, so and in Amazon we do not have a concept of template. It's yes, something right. called machine images. So, but the whole idea of Beanstalk is that you don't need to worry about images. You have your code and that is what you want to focus on. You just push that code onto Beanstalk and let it... Right, right, right. I think you say that the template uh, in terms of different like auto database. So you create a whole batch of services. Yeah, yes. We are going to deploy our application. Yeah, you want to templatize that. So yes, basically. Yeah. Template. So I'll come to that. So cloud formation is the service for that. So there is a di different level of abstraction that is there between all of these three services. So Beanstalk cloud formation offers has a different level of abstraction, and at the same time, it has a different level of granularity under what control you can have it. Because what you told, we can create very easily with going to basic instance and go to RT, create one, check it, and configure it. So it's all in one way. Correct. So it's easy for you if you know those terminals. There are a lot of three letter acronyms which you need to understand. Right. So the value proposition of Beanstalk is that you don't need to do that. Right. You have your code, just upload to Beanstalk and let Beanstalk take care of the thing. So it's, uh, you can always do it on your own. So you can launch an EC2, attach a load balancer to it and do whatever you want to do. The thing is that's an effort. You can avoid that by using these two. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we the extension time. Correct. Correct. So suppose we use a micro and then you will automatically scale into a large no, no, so it will not do vertical scaling, it will keep on launching more and more T1 micros depending upon your configuration. So, so it, it's always important that you take a estimate initially that maybe T1 micro may not be good enough for me, so let me launch it with an M1 medium or an M1 launch and see how that uh, spans out in terms of load and all and then see your billing as to how you, where you want to cut it out and then go up or higher, uh, up or uh, lower into the PC configuration. Sorry? No, you cannot do mix and match. <laughs> because it, it will try to create a homogeneous environment. So now comes the cloud formation. So cloud formation, uh, it's again an abstraction at another level, wherein what it allows you to do, you can create a JSON template of the entire infrastructure. Right, so in Elastic Beanstalk, you created an application and threw it at the service which created a bit. But on the other spectrum, you can say that I want to control my entire infrastructure from the ground up. And that is what the cloud formation does. So it makes the infrastructure as a code. So you can actually write the JSON template. I'll show you some of the samples in here. So you can create a JSON te template, JSON file of your uh, entire infrastructure and upload that. So you can even define some of the application stack scenarios in uh, cloud formation script itself. So this is the stack. So suppose this is your infrastructure in Amazon. So you are using Cloud 53, Cloud Run. So there are multiple services that you are using. Right? And imagine that you have a requirement where you want to redeploy this environment from Singapore <laughs> into Tokyo as well. Or you want to create this environment in Ireland as well. Right? One way is that you keep on doing this manually one by one. Another is that you create a cloud formation template out of it and whenever you want it, you redeploy it and it will create everything again without you having to do anything manually. So there is a company in Delhi who do uh, these quarterly quiz competitions so, uh, which are online coding and all that. So they, they also need a FT setup. They need like 30, 35 servers which are doing only this or only uh, the quizzing competition, the code evaluations and all that. So they don't do all of this manually. So what they do is they have a cloud formation template, they launch it and it creates something similar to this and they are ready with the coding competition and after some 15, 20 days when the competition is over, they just terminate the stack and all of this gets deleted automatically. 
so that you don't run off uh, forgetting a particular resource being released and still getting paid for. So, so this cloud foundation template is good when you want to have a uh, infrastructure with cap, it becomes repeatable. Right, so let us see what a template is. So the template can actually be uh, stored in Git, subversion or whatever the code repository is. You can create multiple repeatable models out of it. So let us uh, do a quick uh, anatomy of a cloud formation template. So this is a JSON. You recognize this of course. Right? So this is JSON. So you can define, I want to launch this kind of resource with uh, these kind of res uh, resources with uh, these names and these particular uh, properties of uh, this particular resource. You can specify launch for this, uh, include this key pair, include this AMI and launch this particular type of instance. Okay. And similarly, you can define multiple restrictions etc. so that you can restrict the user that always launch a T1 micro and never launch more than T1 micro. So you can restrict that in here. And apart from that, you can also get, get an output. So suppose your entire uh, infrastructure has been launched over an EC2 instance, you would like to know the URL of that EC2 instance, so that can also be extracted out of the cloud formation script itself. So that was one aspect as, as to how you launch the entire infrastructure. Second is, so you have the EC2 instances running, what do you want to do in there, that can also be controlled using the user view. So here, as you can see, the script automatically is installing all of these packages from here. Right? And apart from that, you can also put for your code. So suppose you have some code in a Git repository, you want to copy it into a particular folder, in this case, user local pin, whatever. So it can actually pull that code and deploy it here. So you see, so it not only automates the entire infrastructure, it customizes the operating system and the server-side environment and deploys your custom code on top of it. So all of these three aspects of uh, automation, automating your infrastructure and application can be covered through this. Now if you recall Elastic Beanstalk, so in Beanstalk you only focus on the code and let the entire uh, stack below it be, uh, uh, comes automatically, whereas in uh, cloud formation, you can customize the operating system to a certain extent, whereas everything above that is totally customizable by your end user. So you can define whatever you want to do over that in past. So does that give you an idea of the difference between Beanstalk and Cloud Formation? Okay. So I also have a demo for Cloud Formation. Cloud formation portal. As you can see, there are multiple templates already available on our web page. So you can actually create a WordPress site, Google, Joomla. Most of the templates are already created. So you can select some of the options in there. Uh, since this is launching a database, so the database parameters can also be configured here. So when the database comes up, it will automatically have some of these options pre-configured in Tagging. So whatever resources you launch in Amazon can actually be tagged. So this tagging uh, is a powerful feature. It allows you to do cost allocation, pays, charge backs, and all that. So we'll talk about that. So the stack is now creation is in progress. Here also you will see all the events which are being launched. So this again will do all of these. What has been instructed in the JSON template will uh, the all will keep on getting blocked here. As you can see, all the events are locked, and when the PA complete happens, you will see the output. So there is something called output tab. You can see the output of that cloud formation template, and uh, most of all that. Uh, so, so now your entire application has been cloud. When you want to terminate all of this, all you need to do is right click on this and say terminate. So, this cloud formation will actually destroy all the resources in the back. So in this demo, 
is creating an image so that uh, you restore it back. So, any questions about this? It gives you an idea of the distinction of the two services. Right? So now let's move on to offsource. So now the two services that we spoke about, Beanstalk and uh, CloudFormation, we did not talk about how you are going to manage your applications. Like I think uh, Jasmine would have perhaps touched that in his session as to you have say hundreds of servers all having a particular version of an application and now you want to update all of the, those hundred servers with a new application, how will you do that? So that is not explicitly covered both in Beanstalk and in CloudFormation. However, there are ways of handling that. In Beanstalk, you can have another version of environment and swap the URLs. CloudFormation, you can create another stack and then swap the URLs. But there is no direct way of handling that in uh, the other two services. But as Opsworks is actually is made to handle that kind of scenario, it is an integrated application management solution. So it is uh, dependent upon the... Uh, so if you are already using Chef, it can actually take that uh, Chef, take those Chef recipes and include that as part of this. And uh, it can allow the full control and automation of the application deployment. In so these are some of the management challenges in when you deploy applications and when you are really scaling to a very large level, you will see that none of the shell scripts or the manual efforts will be able to handle them. So it comes back to reliability. So this is the typical flow that you do in code, build, test, provision, deploy, and monitor. So while this is just an example, so you can do the coding on Git, uh, do the entire dev and test system on uh, using Jenkins, and once you want to deploy the code, you can push it to all source. This is again an example. So uh, in another environment, well, this is something that we do not explicitly control. In an Oxford's uh, like environment, you can have a full control right from the underlying uh, server side environment to the upload objects to the stack. This is some of the terminology. So, uh, stack is a typical three tier architecture. You have web, app, and database that is called a stack. And then you have the layers. So, web layer, app layer, DB layer. So, you, when you throw a server into a particular layer, you don't need to then uh, think about how it's going to be configured. Absorbs will automatically get a server in a web layer and configure it according to a web server uh, definition that you provide. And this is how a typical flow works like. So you deploy your application into optional service, you publish the code into the GitHub, uh, the EC2 instances, the RH box in the middle, that will actually keep on calling the optional service and whenever there is a new release, etc., it, uh, it will pull the metadata from Opsworks, get the, uh, get the code and some of the meta information from S3, and get the actual code from GitHub, deploy it all to itself, and publish the shelf logs, etc., back to the S3, and acknowledge back to the option. So this way you can automate the entire application management, etc., across the cluster of servers like here. Uh, is there a, is there like a dedicated chef master server running for each of the stacks or each of the environments or so, so this optional service will manage that so that acts as the uh, yeah. chef master it's out of beta now right Opsworks? so our definition of beta is different beta does not mean that it's not production ready and ready for support uh, beta means that we are still not at that feature parity as compared to the leading product in the industry. So beta does not mean you cannot use it in production. So even RPS, our database service has been in beta for a very long time and got out of beta now. Right. But we took the support in production. Yeah, From our perspective, we want it to be feature parity with whatever is leading in the industry. Yeah. Sir, uh, yeah, correct. But point is that there is no chef agent that sits in a big stock. If you want to do your own, you can do it. But then it doesn't come bundled as part of the big stock service. And so this is, as you can say, this is heavily dependent upon the agent that sits on the EC2. In Beanstalk, you can launch another version of the application or another environment and then do the swap URLs, etc. But the running instances as such cannot be modified from a code perspective until unless you have an agent in Yeah, 
that. So uh, that is bit of a work if you want to customize that. You can take the raw AMI that uh, Opsource gives, customize that with your own code and then publish it back into Opsource to use it. There is uh, right now not a straightforward way of doing that, but that's possible. Okay. Similarly in Beanstalk, Beanstalk gives some AMIs which are built in into Beanstalk. You can take that AMI, launch an EC2 instance, customize that and push it back into Beanstalk so that that becomes your golden image. Opsource does allow you to uh, run your own custom share scripts, share yeah, press keys on any of the That's the whole purpose. That's the whole purpose. So, does it give an idea of the difference between the three services? Great, so, uh, so this kind of summarizes uh, the whole thing. So, you have install Opsworks. So, there is a, a trade off between the convenience versus the control that you want to have on top of your services. So, in install, it's most convenient. You just upload the code and forget. In Opsworks, again, there is a bit of a work, but it abstracts again a lot of services. In cloud formation, you can start from bare minimum and uh, build it up from there. And on an EC2, of course, you can do whatever you want to do. So this is the whole uh, nature of Amazon Web Services that focus on your core application and let the entire undifferentiated everything go down to the services that cloud offers. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh, happy to take any more questions that you may have. How do you get into that? Uh, so these three, all these three services are such a free. There is no charge for any of these services. Whatever resources that get spun up by using those services are charged. So there is an online calculator that we have. So you can say that I'll have say I have 10 servers. Out of those 10 servers, 5, five servers will be running 24 cross 7. The other 5 will only come say 50% of the time in a So it will gain spoil the load. Yeah, so you cannot you can only estimate that. There is no uh, guarantee that that will be to your end right? But it depends upon your book. If there is a breaking news, there is a breaking news, right? You cannot control it. Like an entity. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, billing alerts. So I think he's talking about the estimated billing in advance before you even buy an infrastructure. So that is a bit difficult, but that's the whole value of cloud that you don't. Uh, I mean, you worry about your cost, but you don't worry about the infrastructure. As well. you can, you can get the cost of your. So you can, you can decide how many minimum instances to run, and based on that, you can get the minimum cost that you just. If it all order scales, then your cost will go up and down based on load. The one important thing to, uh, to focus on is that your site will always work because it's not going to go down because any amount of load will be, will be serviced based on uh, order scales. Cost is a bit tricky thing to measure in a uh, dynamic environment. In enterprises, it becomes more predictable because you know that I'll have these two servers serving in exchange for me. There are data rates which you cannot predict. Sorry? There are data rates which you cannot predict. Data rates. Data out. Yeah, data out. Yeah, correct. So, yeah, so yeah. You can predict the maximum instance. Correct. You can do a intelligent guess. Yeah. That's true. Correct. Great. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thanks. Thanks.